All right, I'm here with Eurasia Group founder, Ian Brammer. Ian, thanks for making time amid, what are we calling it? What happened in Russia? A mutiny? A rebellion? How are you? I'd call it a rebellion. I would call it, um, it's not quite clear that it was an attempted coup, uh, but it certainly was a rebellion. I, I think that's an easy one. So as far as characterizing the rebellion, we're hearing from Prigozhin. I mean, it's been interesting to hear that he said, he said in the past couple of days, Putin, uh, putting his spin on it, Prigozhin putting his spin on it, uh, Prigozhin saying, this was just, uh, you know, us trying to showcase what we could do. I was upset with the military. I was not trying to overtake the uh, regime here. I wasn't trying to bring down Putin. Do you buy Prigozhin's argument so far? You, you know, the funny thing, Mo, uh, is I do. Uh, and, and you, you know, it's not that I have any trust in the guy. Uh, but the fact was that he was in a completely untenable position. Now, some of it of his own making, but the, the fact was he was in this increasingly acrimonious and public fight uh, with the Minister of Defense that had been allowed to fester and uh, deteriorate for months. And, and I, I noted uh, two weeks before uh, the rebellion uh, that uh, the Minister of Defense had announced that all paramilitary soldiers needed to sign contracts directly with the MOD, become, in other words, uh, physically underneath the accountability and authority of the official Russian defense forces. And for example, um, Kadyrov, who is the Chechen warlord that has the second most powerful paramilitary group um, in Russia fighting in Ukraine as well, they all said, sure, we'll sign that. We're loyal to the Kremlin. Prigozhin said no. And at the time, Putin hadn't weighed in on it. But a week ago, Putin did. He had a little group uh, meeting with a bunch of Russian military bloggers who are very patriotic, very supportive of the war, and have also been quite critical occasionally of the Russian Ministry of Defense. And in that meeting, Putin directly said for the first time, um, I expect the Wagner troops to sign those contracts with the Ministry of Defense. Well, I mean, this puts Prigozhin in a completely impossible situation. By July 1, that was the deadline. If they didn't sign, he was directly countermanding a Putin order, which, I mean, has never happened since Putin has been president. And wouldn't you know, but if he, but if he signed it over, he loses his power base. I mean, the people that are keeping him alive, vis-a-vis -vis the Minister of Defense and their forces, and there have been assassinations uh, against his forces um, internally over the past weeks and months. I mean, if he signs them over, he's also done for. So who? what do you do in that situation? Well, he decided that he was going to continue to countermand the order. But now it's it's treason. I mean, you know, at that point, this is before he sends his troops to Moscow. He starts marching on it. He's already basically saying the commander in chief of the Russian forces, I'm saying no. And this guy's a dictator. He's a ruthless dictator. So what do you do at that point? He's on borrowed time. He takes his forces and, uh, and he marches first to Rostov, takes it over, then to Voronezh, and then on to Moscow. And I mean, that's, it's kind of suicidal. It's kind of shocking he's still alive, but it wasn't like he had any good choices remaining. So I, I think I could have come close to writing Prigozhin's speech uh, before he wrote it. There, there was really nothing else from the set. You know, ultimately, this came down to a personal issue. Prigozhin likes his power base. He likes his mercenary force. He likes his autonomy. Putin wants to consolidate forces. Uh, everyone else falls in line. Prigozhin doesn't. And Prigozhin sort of takes it to an extreme here, though, saying, you know, I'm going to say no, but I'm also going to show what I can do and embarrass you effectively, Vlad. Well, it's more than just embarrass him. I mean, 15 Russian airmen are dead. Um, that were firing on Prigozhin's uh, column of, of troops, armored personnel carriers heading up to Moscow. He shoots down a number of those planes. Those are Russian planes uh, in the middle of a war going on in Ukraine. And, and he shows that he is prepared to say no to the direct order of the undisputed dictator of Russia. Uh, and a lot of people have been killed in Russia for a lot less. A lot of people have been jailed just for peaceful demonstrations in Russia. This was not a peaceful demonstration. And as of right now, he's still alive. 
and and he's he's getting away with it. But but Putin's speech, Putin's speech said that they're going to be held accountable. The people that are responsible for this rebellion, and of course, the person who is ultimately responsible, also the person that Putin personally built up and allowed to create this unprecedentedly strong uh, paramilitary group, are, are one and the same. Uh, Evgeny Prigozhin. So, I mean, my view, Mo is that he's not going to be with us for long. He's either going to be killed uh, or they'll be they'll they'll find some additional charges. Uh, the, the terms of the deal will be altered uh, and he'll be put on a show trial. Uh, but allowing Prigozhin to continue to operate independently and speak as a free man is an unacceptable threat to the Russian president. What do we make of Putin's decisions? over the course of the last week, because as you said, many people have been jailed or killed for much less. Uh, this, this is, you know, cater turned mercenary leader, typical uh, professional trajectory there. Uh, and he, you know, sent tanks, he killed airmen and Putin just let him go. What, what do we think came over Putin here? The timing for Putin could not have been uh, less opportune. Uh, if Putin had decided to order his troops to fire on Prigozhin and his thousands of Wagner forces, many of whom are seriously well-trained mercenaries, special force type capabilities. I, I have no doubt that Putin would have emerged victorious tactically. Uh, Prigozhin would be captured or dead. His people would be demolished. I mean, that, that, that I think Putin has every capacity to do that. Uh, it's not like, Prigozhin had any supporters inside the Russian military because, you know, that's precisely the people he's been going after. for. Right. The was that something tomorrow. Prigozhin was looking for, we think, that when he was marching right. on Moscow, he was hoping for allies to come out? Again, I, I think he was in an untenable position. So, I mean, he might have been hoping, you know, that that was going to come from the heavens, but I don't think he had any reason to believe it was going to happen. Uh, mm -hmm. But but I want to answer your question. So why did Putin let him go? Um, and the answer was that if Putin had decided to fire on him, um, he was going to face an enormous distraction, maybe an existential distraction from the defenses that he's been holding quite well uh, on the ground in the front lines in Ukraine. Remember, you've got a real war that's going on. You've got a Ukrainian counteroffensive. You've got 11 divisions that are uh, trained and equipped by NATO, ready to fight. Only two and a half of them had been involved directly in the counteroffensive thus far, which hasn't gone so well. Suddenly, you know, Wagner's gone, Kadyrov taking his troops out of Ukraine to go fight Wagner, and you're going to have this big question about the lines of authority within the MOD. You could easily see the Russian front lines of defense fall apart. And so then not only are you expending your most loyal forces to fire on Russian forces, but you're also potentially allowing the Ukrainians to break the land bridge, threaten Crimea, lose everything you've been fighting over for the last year and a half. So anyone rational in Putin's position at that moment would say, we need to hold off on that fight and cut a deal with Prigozhin. We need to defang him. We, we need to contain him. We need to undermine him. But but that's very different from we're going to let him live. Right. Right. Um, so I, I, I think that there's a very clear. But but I mean, the question is a good one because this is a piece of information we didn't have before. There are a lot of people in the West that are saying, oh, my God, Putin is irrational. And if you push Putin beyond his red lines, like he could use nuclear weapons. You push Putin beyond his red lines. He could go out in a blaze of glory. Well, what we've learned in the last 72 hours is that Putin has been pushed in unprecedented fashion by a man that was loyal to him in every way, suddenly became enemy number one of the state. And when Putin is pushed maximally, he actually behaves with restraint and mm -hmm. rationality to ensure the preservation of himself and his regime. And that's rather an important piece of revealed information as you think about the future of the war in Ukraine. Now, the dangerous thing is that, that if, if I'm a member of NATO 
or if I'm the U.S. president, I now see fewer causes to restrain myself from sending F-16s or long range missiles or things that would allow the Ukrainians not just to take their land back incrementally, but even to start striking into Russia itself to make it easier to defeat the Russians and stop them from doing this again. Because, well, we know Putin is focused on self-preservation. As long as you're not trying to decapitate the regime, you can get away with that stuff. That, that is a, obviously um, a more risky strategy than the one the Americans and NATO have been pursuing with the Ukrainians heretofore. Fascinating. So Putin, over the weekend, keep eye on the prize. we got to keep focus on Ukraine. Let's cut a short-term deal. We'll eventually get Prigozhin. I know where he is. He's under the care of my buddy Lukashenko right. in Belarus. But the lesson you think the West can take away from this is they can up the fight. That, I, I, that I think Putin is a rational actor here. I think a more rational actor, and I think that that is the lesson that they are taking away on the basis of my conversations with U.S. officials and NATO officials, um, it is not clear that uh, you want to take that that lesson to its ultimate conclusion. What do we know? You know, 18 months we've spent, uh, the West has spent on sanctions, on a, on a whole bunch of ways to try to cut away at Putin's authority. Uh, what was Putin standing before this weekend? And what's our sense of his standing within Russia you know, I've seen, uh, you know, there's no shortage of analysis pieces about Putin is weaker now, Putin is weaker. What does that actually mean in terms of his authority within Russia after this weekend? Well, I mean, the sanctions, remember when, when Russia first invaded uh, Ukraine, the American position uh, with the NATO allies was we're going we're gonna to maximally sanction this guy. We're going to freeze his sovereign assets that are in jurisdictions that NATO has access to. Um, we're going to cut off his gas. We're going to work to cut off. Um, all of his trade, we're going to freeze the assets of his oligarchs, stop their transit, all of this stuff, and that's going to cripple them. Uh, and we're not going to do much militarily because, frankly, Putin's going to be able to destroy Zelensky in relatively short order anyway. Turned out that they were wrong about both of those things, that the sanctions didn't really cripple the Russian economy, uh, but the Russians weren't able uh, to take Ukraine in a fight. The Ukrainians fought very courageously. The Russian military was rife with corruption and incompetence. And so the Americans learned that lesson and started changing their strategy and started leaning much more on providing increasingly uh, technologically advanced defensive and offensive weapons to the Ukrainians and the best intelligence and the best training uh, and start integrating them much more with real security guarantees. And that has allowed the Ukrainians to mount their own counteroffensive and, and start pushing the Russians out of their territory. So, I mean, I think those that that's the way that the West has perceived this war so far. Uh, the NATO has been in lockstep largely on how to pursue this fight just last week. 27 European Union countries voted unanimously for the 11th round of sanctions against Russia. That means even countries like Hungary, for example, supporting mm -hmm. uh, that sanction. Uh, you're also continuing to see large amounts, billions and billions of dollars in euros that are being deployed, not just to support the Ukrainians militarily, but also to start focusing on reconstruction. Uh, so, I mean, the fact is that Putin is considered a war criminal. He has brought NATO further together. He has brought the G7 further together. He's he's brought the Democrats and Republicans further together. Uh, they, they both hate Putin more than they hate each other. Internally in Russia, uh, what's our sense of Putin's authority, uh, the perception of the people, uh, how much they've put up with for the last 18 months, uh, you know, to the extent that we you know, have any assessment of what's going on inside the Kremlin, around military leaders, et cetera, again, pre this weekend yeah. and post this weekend. Well, How mean, much damage did Prigozhin do it. to Putin? Pre, pre this weekend, um, the war was going pretty badly, uh, well over 100,000 casualties. Uh, these people are the kids of folks in Russia. They're known by their communities. Obviously, that creates a great deal of distress and dissatisfaction in a small 
uh, population in Russia, most of whom are not in positions of authority, most of whom are not elites in Russia, also about a million young Russian men and their immediate families fled. Uh, and those are people that are professionally capable and have access to the Georgias, the Armenias, the UAEs. Um, and that, of course, long term hurts Russia. But the Russian economy, unlike the military, has been relatively capably managed uh, by people, the Minister of, of, of Finance, the uh, central bank governor, very capable people. And the Russian economy has not done that bad. It contracted by about 2% last year. This year, it looks flat to maybe nominal growth. You know, I mean, it hasn't really done much damage. And while uh, the, the rebellion was going on, there were no senior military officials that defected. Not a single high level government official defected. No oligarchs defected. And, and no one's talking about that in the Western media. But, you know, we, it's a fact and we need to recognize that. So I don't believe that Putin faces an imminent threat. Uh, inside Russia today. I think that this is a symbolic hit to him that no one imagined would have been countenanced, would have been acceptable uh, before this weekend. And, and certainly, I think that will create more incentive, more impetus for um, people that might have considered uh, coup plotting uh, a palace you know, attempt intrigue around the Kremlin. I mean, there's there certainly is a, a higher risk factor around Putin over the coming one, two years than we would have seen before Prigozhin uh, decided to uh, to make his suicide run. But at this point, it's not like, it, it, to your point, nothing imminent. And Putin is still, you know, effectively uh, you know, uh, the uh, authoritative dictator of Russia? You know, for me, it's like an extreme version of January 6th in the United States. Uh, what happened was unprecedented, unthinkable. And yet the day after, nothing had actually really changed in the day-to-day -day business of the country. But what happened was this sense that, wow, our, our institutions actually have some structural challenges, that, that maybe there's an existential problem with our democracy. And if we don't resolve it, it's going to keep getting worse. I think an extreme version of that has just happened in Russia. What, what, what happened to Putin and the Prigozhin effort was unthinkable. It was unprecedented. No one thought it could happen. And yet the day after, Russia's pretty normal. But there's a risk here. And the risk in Russia, of course, is a lot greater to Putin and what might happen to that system than the risk in the United States. So I was watching the Biden remarks uh, and he made a point repeating multiple times, we weren't involved, we're not involved, we're not involved. Um, you, you mentioned in your conversations with, with uh, you know, Western leaders, you know, we might up the ante in Ukraine here. What other lessons are there to be taken away uh, for President Biden and other Western leaders uh, from the events of the weekend? Well, I mean, it's kind of like uh, Sun Tzu. Uh, I mean, never get in the way of your enemy when they're making mistakes. Uh, and and I, I think that lesson was taken very clearly. Biden was down in uh, in Camp David uh, with his national security team. They were in very close, uh, basically real time communication with all core NATO allies. The talking points were highly orchestrated and coordinated. Um, and there was, this is not a crisis. We do not need to be talking to the Kremlin right now. There were low level communications directly to the Russians. They, they uh, told the Russians, no NATO troops are moving, no evacuations of American personnel uh, on the, from the embassy grounds. They, they, they did actually tell all the, the diplomats that they had to stay on the official grounds. They didn't want them traveling around Moscow, but that was the only move that was taken. They didn't want to do anything that would allow the Russian government to point the finger at the Americans or others to say, this is an external effort to bring down the country, especially because in the worst case scenario, that could be seen as a provocation that could lead to escalation that nobody wants. The, right. the, the American policy here is not to destroy Russia. It's not to destroy the Russian economy. It's not to change the regime. The American policy is to support the Ukrainians, to allow them to get their territory back, 
to ensure that Russia is not capable of taking another bite at that apple in another one or five years, and also to give a lesson to countries, especially China, that this kind of illegal invasion of your neighbor in the future will not be tolerated, will bear consequences from the U.S. and its allies in the security sphere. That is the policy. And that it's very important that that policy be made consistent and clear going forward. I'll give you an example that people don't understand. So India is buying all of this oil from Russia. And I'm sure you've heard this, Mo, everyone complaining, look at how much oil the Indians are buying from Russia. And they're mm -hmm. supposed to be friends of the Americans, but look at how much oil they're buying. It is U.S. policy that the Indians be allowed to buy that oil from Russia. That, that's It's not stated U.S. policy, but it's absolutely U.S. policy. Because if you try to stop the, the, the Indians and the Chinese and others from buying it through secondary sanctions, I mean, first of all, you destroy the global energy market. The price on the American consumer and its allies would be unacceptably high. You would drive the world into a massive recession. You'd also potentially destroy the Russian economy in ways that would force the Russians to take far greater escalatory moves, not just in Ukraine, but against NATO. No one actually wants that to happen. So U.S. policy is incredibly strong in terms of providing support for Ukraine, but it is incredibly restrained in terms of trying to, you know, existentially hurt Putin. And I think what you saw over the weekend was an effort to manifest that to the Kremlin, um, to, try to, to try to restrain the level of risk that exists outside of the Ukrainian front. I think a lot of folks try to simplify things, you know, Putin bad, we want him out. Uh, this good, this bad, whereas the world is full of shades of gray, right? Policies are complicated. Relationships are complicated. And it seems like we want to keep everything, you know, in football terms between the 40 yard lines. We don't want to be off on extremes uh, and be dealing with uh, unprecedented scenarios. Well, I, I think we're happy to play down to the 30 or the 20 on the Russian side of the field. Um, I think we'd like all of the fighting to be like on the Russian side of the field and a little bit on the Western side, right? And so, mm. yeah, you're taking some hits, particularly economically, if you're Europe right now and you you have to like, you know, suddenly change your energy complex and wean yourself off of Russian gas completely. So definitely there's some hits. But the point is, it's not from 40 to 40, right? There's a Russian side of the field. You want it there, but you're not pushing to the end zone. You're not trying to sweep the Russians off the field. Um, and yeah, Putin bad. Uh, and by the way, I'll tell you something really interesting. Um, when when Trump gave that CNN town hall and mm -hmm. he was asked, and I don't, not just asked, he was pushed by my friend Caitlin Collins, a very capable journalist. So is Trump, it, it, do you think that Putin is a war criminal? And he didn't really want to answer that question. He was like, no, 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 no. But I mean, I'm asking you right now. Uh, you know, do you consider Putin to be a war criminal? And Trump said, now is not the time to answer that question. But, you know, it's like uh, there, there will be a time to talk about, you know, what Putin did and, and how we want to deal with it. But right now, you don't want to push this guy into a position where he has no ability um, to continue to essentially stay on the field. And privately, my friends in the Biden administration, almost to a man, agree with that. Wow. That's despite Biden official policy. I mean, the president, the secretary of state, everyone has said Putin's a war criminal. Well, I mean, let's keep in mind that um, it's the International Criminal Court that declared Putin a war criminal first. It was not the United States. Mm -hmm. The United States has gone along with it. And Biden is frequently intemperate and unrestrained in the kinds of things he says. That's different from his policy. Yeah. Um, but but also the Americans are not a signatory of the International Criminal Court. Right. We, we uh, share that. We share that with the Chinese and the Russians right. and the Ukrainians. So, yeah. I, I mean, here's the, the point is that I understand that there is a rightful anger. Like I consider Putin a war criminal. Mm -hmm. and, and it's very clear from what's been done on the ground. And Lord knows Prigozhin is a war criminal thousands of times over. But if I were president of the United States, I would not want to be saying that. 
Um, and, uh, you know, it's one of the reasons I would rather not be president of the United States. Right. I mean, like, I no, I, my revealed preference is to be able to speak my mind and be authentic, yeah. like as much as humanly and, possible. And as soon as you go into an official position, you really can't do that. And and we've had a few of these cases of of, of the government, the Biden administration having to play cleanup for the president here in regards to China, in Taiwan, regards to Russia, Russia, yeah. Russia uh, the, the, you know, Xi Jinping's dictator. Like right after Blinken's trip, you know, and did that trip go well? Blinken, you missed it. Uh, that's, that's the way. I, that's the <laughs> you way hear I that, folks? But, um, actually, I, I want to ask you about that before we go here. Yeah. Um, China, uh, any lessons they take from the, the whole Putin weekend developments, weekend of Putin's, and uh, coming out of that Blinken meeting, uh, any lessons? What is the state of, of U.S. China? And I should say, uh, when we spoke last year, Ian, I, you know, I, I still remember the um, comparison you make. U.S., China, divorced parents, custody of the world. How How is our uh, custody situation going? Still true. Still true. I mean, the, there is a floor in the U.S.-China relationship. That floor has been tested. But the fact is we still have kids that we care about. Uh, and that that is the reason why Blinken made that trip. That is the reason why the U.S. has said that we are putting the balloon incident behind us. We're closing that chapter. That is the reason why Janet Yellen has just announced that she's making a trip to Beijing. But there's no trust in the relationship. We don't like each other. And that means that the risks around it are very significant. But, you know, again, keep in mind, American corporations and banks still want to do business. America's allies still want to do business. It's very hard to fight a Cold War when you're the only one fighting it. Uh, and right. that is a constraint on U.S. policy. But what did the Chinese, what did we learn about the Chinese? Well, I, I mean, you know, we just saw Putin facing a potentially existential threat, and it certainly would have seemed that way to the Chinese over the weekend. And uh, they like Putin a lot. They want him to stay in power. They are not prepared to accept any domestic risk, any, to continue to ensure that Putin stays in power. And that's a rather interesting takeaway as well. I mean, you know, you look at who Putin's friends are globally, it's Belarus and that, you know, Iran on a good day. And that's about it. They're, everyone wants to do business with Russia. Mm -hmm. Everyone wants to, you know, buy their stuff. But but actually take on domestic risk to support them. There's really very, very little. And that that's important, I think, for the, to recognize on what the Chinese did not do over the last three days. Right. They put out a statement afterwards saying, Putin, you know, we we love you, but they, they weren't intervening in the in dramatic way. moments. Yeah. And, and they, they surely could have said a lot at the time to support him, and they chose not to. Okay. So and and conscious choice by the Chinese president. And finally here, Ukraine uh, war hitting 17 months, almost 18 months now. Uh, Counteroffensive has been slow. Obviously, there's a distraction in Russia. Um, how does uh, how do the next few months play out here? Uh, and how much time is this counteroffensive given, and what are the implications for this counteroffensive, good, bad, ugly, in yeah, terms it, of it ramps ongoing up support? now. Yeah. Uh, and and remember, the counteroffensive, as I said, not many troops have been involved yet. They haven't even really pressed the first of Russia's three dug-in defensive lines yet. Um, they now probably will in short order, days to weeks. Um, and they, there's a greater likelihood that the Ukrainians are able to take some significant territory, though much less than if Putin had decided to take the fight to Prigozhin, which again is the reason why almost certainly he decided against it. Uh, so we'll see. We'll see. I mean, clearly, uh, to the extent that the Ukrainians take more territory back and they have all of this defense support, security guarantees being developed by the U.S. and allies and reconstruction support, Zelensky will be in a better position to pause the fighting before the end of the year and support negotiations um, because he'll have an upper hand in a way that he has not over the last six months. Um, whether the Russians can be enticed to the table in that environment is an open question. Ultimately, does it come down to Zelensky being willing to give up some of Ukraine in the end? Uh, negotiated settlement? I think so. Uh, not because he not because he has any moral obligation to it's his territory. Uh, but I think that he is very unlikely to be able to retake all of the land that was taken from him since February 24th by the Russians. Now, so he, I don't think he I don't think there's any reason why he should ever have to renounce that that territory is his. But but might there be reasons for him, compelling reasons 
for him to be willing to accept a pause in the fighting or even open negotiations before he has all of that territory secured? Yes, I could absolutely see that. Ian Bremer, I appreciate you taking time uh, and uh, downloading us sure. on uh, your conversations and your analysis, and I appreciate it. My pleasure, Mo.